The last topic we need to address before this week's midterm and before our discussion in class on Wednesday is marriage and kinship. So I apologize for the terrible pun here, but it's it's true when we say that kinship is relative. So the approach we take as anthropologists to understanding kinship is to focus on what we call ego or the individual, right? So we want to have an understanding of how individuals construct and understand who they are related to. And the reason for this is that all societies have kinship structures, all societies have ways of um, identifying who individuals are related to and not all of them are biological in basis so we have a, a distinction that's made between consanguineal kin or blood kin and then also a finnal kin kin by marriage and to in-laws and one of the other things i want to talk with you folks in class is some of the other forms or ways that we might construct kin um, aside from legal arrangements or socioeconomic political arrangements or through through our blood connectivity or through genetics right When we do make kin and when we attempt to understand kin, we look for the various ways that we make distinctions because even though we have different ways of recognizing kin, uh, again, they we see our relatedness to them in different kinds of ways. So we can look at generational differences and note that this table focuses on how we make these distinctions in terms of what we call kinship terminology or the, the, the terms or concepts that we, or names that we apply to our kin members. So we have a distinction in terms of generation, right? So think about the difference between, in English, parents and grandparents. Uh, sex and or gender is also a means by which that uh, we may distinguish between our various kin members. Uh, affinity, again, our connection through marriage, right? So as the example states here, we make a distinction between um, our our mother or the individual who gave birth to us or raised to us um, or mother-in-law. And I apologize, Polly has decided she's going to be in this video no matter what. Um, we've had a very long discussion about this. It wasn't worth fighting about. Uh, collaterality, uh, how, again, closely or directly linked we are to those individuals, right? And again, um, kinship terminology or the names that we use to describe our kin often reflect this, these varying degrees of closeness. And indeed, how we make the distinction between friends and family or distant relatives and close relatives. Um, all of these kind of distinctions are, are critical and important and again tell us something about how these relationships are built. Uh, we may look at the sex or gender of linking relative. Again, this, this notes that in English we don't use this. So if I'm talking about um, my brother-in-law, for example, you don't know if, um, well, you know what the, the sex or the gender of it is, but you don't know how I'm related to that brother-in-law. Is it uh, because this individual married my sister? Did they marry my brother? Um, or um, are they married to someone that I am related to, such as, uh, let's say, my spouse's sibling's spouse, right? So we don't have an English clear distinctions for this. Um, we often have to explain, again, how we are related to these individuals, uh, but other languages do have this. Uh, bifurcation, so again, uh, some cultures, uh, some languages make distinctions between relatives we have on our mother's side versus those on our father's side. Um, Again, if I were to just say to you, oh, that was my uncle, I would often have to follow up with saying, oh, my uncle, who's my mother's brother, for example, to distinguish from my other uncle, who is my father's brother. Um, and I come from a very large family. My mom is one of five kids. My dad was one of 10. So these kind of distinctions, I, I wish that I had kinship terminology to distinguish because often explaining, again, which of these siblings I'm referring to of my parents uh, gets complicated because of relative ages as well, right? So is that my brother or sorry my dad's oldest brother or his second oldest brother or his younger brother or which one of his younger brothers we don't have uh, distinctions in English that separate out birth order at least in terms of terminology again we have to use a lot more language to describe it So again, so what then are these kinship terminologies and why do we care about these distinctions? Well, is that cross-cultural studies or ethnology has demonstrated that societies do differ in terms of how we group and distinguish our relatives. And this is reflected in our language. And when we return to language and communication later on in the term, you'll, you'll get into this a little bit more and we can loop back into this conversation topic. Uh, but again, the terminology that's used reflects all these different criteria of relatedness, but also reflects broader patterns in the society. And so remember, 
remember that we're attempting to get at that as well, not just individual experiences, but larger cultural patterns. So we might want to know how the families are commonly arranged or organized. And as we'll talk about um, in later on in this lecture, uh, it also signals uh, an understanding of roles of descent and resident as well. So where do we live and, and who um, and how they inherit. The other thing that anthropologists have found is that kinship terms are very resistant to change. So we're going to talk about kinship diagrams, and this is an example of a kinship diagram. And so this is what we mean by ego-centered. So this is an individual here, our informant, our research participant, who's told us about their family. And I'm going to go in, actually, I might as well go into the symbols here now that kinship diagrams, they're not um, the same as uh, like her inheritance patterns or, or um, you know, like a, this isn't a genome. Uh, this is re representing all these different kinds of relationships, right? And so what do we have here is we have ego and then all the individuals who are on the same level as ego are from the same generation. So we would consider these individuals to either be siblings or cousins. The next generation up then would be parents and aunts and uncles. The next generation after that would be grandparents. Again, a vertical line it signals that these individuals are descended from this pairing. An equal sign represents a marriage or another relationship, which we can talk about. And then in terms of uh, the triangle versus the circle, we have a distinction uh, between male and female. And so what we see here is that in the Hawaiian kinship terminology system, and this predates colonial contact, um, is that uh, individuals of the same generation, so ego siblings and cousins, are all referred to using the same term. The only distinction is made on the basis of the gender of the individual. So a brother, uh, a triangle here would have a different term than uh, the circle of the female here. And then we see the same thing at this level that all of the adults in this generation are referred to using the same terminology. So again, it's not that ego doesn't know that these two individuals are their biological parents, but rather because of how the family is structured and organized, how it operates, uh, the same kinship terminology is used. So um, what we might distinguish as an uncle or an aunt uh, would be still referred to as a parent, so a mother or a father. And same thing here, that there's not a distinction between uh, your siblings, so the people you share parents with, and your parents' siblings' children or your cousin. Instead, the same terminology uh, of, of sibling or brother or sister is used throughout. Um, other systems become, uh, again, a little bit more complicated. Uh, the Iroquoian kinship terminology system is the one, and, and note that I won't expect you to ex explain these on the exam, I'm just using this to illustrate the importance of kinship terminologies and some of the variations that exist. Um, this is one that's probably most familiar, to, uh, or is very close, um, at least to um, the system that we use, but you'll notice that there are some, uh, some differences as well. And by we, I mean kind of the kind of standard Euro-American colonial um, structure of, of siblings and, and whatnot, what English has the language to address. Uh, but you'll notice here, however, that parent and their same sex sibling are referred to by the same name. And then the children of that same sex sibling are also referred to um, using the same name. And again, it's not like you know, Katie or Olivia is the same name. I mean, like sibling or brother or sister. Um, whereas uh, the children and of the and the uh, opposite sex sibling of the parent have different terms. Okay. Um, here's a Sudanese kinship uh, system, and what we can see here is that it is increasingly, again, diverse. I don't want to say complicated, but diverse in that every individual in this individual's family has a distinct kinship term that is used to refer to them. So that's simply what all these different patterns mean. Okay, so we're going to return back to kinship diagrams in a second, but let's talk about how do we go from understanding ego and looking at kinship terminology to understanding the relationships that exist between these various individuals. And what a lot of this comes down to is marriage. And marriage is one of the most important concepts that anthropologists have attempted to understand, right? There is cross-cultural variation, but we see some standard patterns, and we're going to talk about these um, in lecture this week. So the one thing I want to emphasize is that, and this is why I've situated talking about this after talking about social 
economic and political organization is that marriage is a contract, right? It is a contract that has political, legal, and economic consequences, right? It serves to regulate our sexuality, it confers sexual rights, and so we can link this back in with our discussion of sexuality, right? Who has the right to reproduce and with whom? It also defines the social identity of offspring, um, which provides what I mentioned here, the context for acculturation, and you'll recall that that's the context under which we learn the appropriate ways of thinking and behaving within our cultural context, but also um, is provides a, a guideline or a rule book in terms of which adults or which individuals are responsible for the care of children. What it also does in terms of regulation is also sets up prohibitions. And particularly when we talk about marriage, and this is something I wanna talk about on Wednesday, is talk about incest prohibitions or what we call incest taboo. And simply these are rules that outline who you are not able to engage in sexual relations with and ultimately then reproduce with, right? So all societies, and I wanna make this clear, all societies have incest taboos or incest prohibitions, but Incest taboos are not all the same, right? So we see cross-cultural variation in terms of who you are and are allowed uh, to, to marry, right? And again, and to engage in sexual relations with. So all societies have incest prohibitions, but not uh, these incest prohibitions do not play out the same. We'll see this again when we look at the, the structure of marriage itself. The reason why we refer to marriage as a political, legal, or a social, a public social contact is it also establishes economic partnerships as well. And in some cases, marriage is not on the basis of love or romantic interest or sexual attraction or compatibility or desire to have children. It is simply a result of families wishing to consolidate um, economic and often political alliances and allegiances. And so this is why we study a finnal ties, or again, those in-law relationships, uh, because it ex serves to extend kinship networks and or groups. Um, and not only does it um, does marriage establish who is responsible for caring for the children, but also establishes the position of the child in the family. And this becomes important, particularly in terms of the transmission of power, of wealth, of resources within the family line. And again, we can talk about some examples of this later. It is symbolically marked with a ceremony and it is a rite of passage. And next week we'll be talking about rite of passages. Uh, so we'll get into this a little bit more. Okay, so I mentioned all societies have marriage, but not all societies um, engage in marriage in the same sort of way. So again, there's kind of rules or patterns that societies follow. And two big patterns that we can begin with by looking is the difference between endogamy and exogamy. So endogamy is simply endo, meaning in, gammy, marriage, or gametes, right? So with in-group marriage, right? Uh, so a good example of this is we see this often within stratified societies, especially caste-based systems, right? Closed-based systems. One of the ways of ensuring that the caste remains closed is to have rules or incest taboo saying that you are not allowed to marry people from outside of your group. You could only marry members within your same group. And we see this actually with uh, being reinforced by religious beliefs where many religions encourage that you only marry individuals of the same faith as you. It serves a number of purposes in dogamy, particularly consolidation of wealth and status. Uh, this is how many royal families have operated over the years, and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, brother-sister marriages, but it can be royal families only marrying other royal families, right? And uh, those of you who are royal watchers or fan fans of the, the British royal family uh, know that this is definitely the case, and endogamy was heavily in, um, emphasized until fairly recently, and even now there's still rules about who um, you can and cannot marry. Exogamy is what might be familiar to, to kind of many of us in the West, where we have a lot more choice and freedom in terms of who our potential partners are. Um, and in many cases, exogamy is seen as preferential. The idea that you want to marry someone outside of your group, that you want to extend your kinship group, you want to extend uh, the individuals you're uh, related to, and you want to promote alliances between those uh, various groups. And again, this is often enforced through an incest taboo, the idea that, well, no, if you can't marry someone within your group because you're already too closely related to them, then you can't marry someone who you're related to, so you have to marry someone outside of this. And again, who your group is and how these groups are defined is dependent on the particular cultural context. We can also talk about, again, the patterns of how many spouses you're permitted to have, right? And so monogamy is one that many of you are familiar with, the idea that individuals can only be married to one other spouse at the time. And in many industrialized nations in kind of Euro-America, this is the only legal option. 
However, there is some variations in terms of what monogamy looks like. Are you married? Are you one and done? So you marry one individual, you're married to them for life and even potentially beyond. Um, as long as you're only with one individual at the time, is it okay to have multiple partners over your lifespan? We refer to this as serial monogamy. Um, Popular culture is very much interested in this, right? Looking at, oh, so-and-so is now dating so-and-so. Oh, no, they broke up or divorced. Now they're dating so-and-so. I mean, look at Pete Davidson is a good example of this, a serial monogamist, right? Uh, he, he's never partnered with more than one person at a time, but he's definitely been with several uh, very public, well-known figures um, in a row. But monogamy is not the only option. And actually, if we look at global patterns, polygamy and its two forms is much more common than monogamy is, um, although this has changed with globalization and with colonialism as well, which has really reinforced uh, not only monogamy, but heteronormativity. Um, but anyways, we'll, we'll talk about that in class. So what then are some of the polygamy or poly, many gammy partner, right? Many partnered uh, patterns. So we can have polygyny or polygyny, uh, which is marriage of one man to more than one woman, um, right? So not all polygamy follows this, although this is a more frequent pattern. Polyandry or the marriage of one woman to more than one man is much more rare um, from a global perspective. I can't remember what the percentage is, but it's very low. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this can be pursued and we can talk about this. But again, what I want to emphasize is that in these cases that, you know, we have these uh, stereotypes here in the West of what polygamy looks like and what polygyny looks like. Um, and polygyny is often presented as the norm. Uh, but there's a number of reasons why um, this is seen. Remember applying a cultural relativism, a valid form of marriage practice, right? Um, again, in wealthy households, this can be an important way of ensuring that wealth stays within a household, right? So you don't have people marrying outside. You just are bringing more family members in. You're strengthening a final ties with other groups. Um, there's often a hierarchical system that can be in place in terms of how the wives run the various households. And this can be a really efficient pattern when uh, women are responsible for a lot of labor within the household, within the family unit. And so it, this helps produce a large number of children or offspring. Um, and so having multiple wives and multiple children uh, can be a very um, uh, res is an effective way of dealing with some of the, the labor requirements and the economic pressures within a household as well. Um, and I also mentioned that we can see this in societies that have a postpartum sex taboo. So some societies have a rule around how long following the birth of a child that, um, the, mar that the married partners can engage in sexual relations again. Um, and in some societies, this can be until the child is weaned. And seeing that the global average of weaning or a child stop um, breastfeeding is around two years of age, um, that would be two years without sexual relations. And so having multiple wives ensures that uh, you can have access to partners during this time. Polyandry, as I mentioned, is much more rare. So this is the marriage of, oops, of, of, uh, and it's the most rarest form of marriage where we have uh, a single woman married to multiple individuals. And when we do see it, it happens in a very few environments, usually where there is extreme re uh, land stress, where uh, basically you have very limited land and other resources. And so uh, yet you still have transmission of wealth and land through the, the male line of the family. So fraternal polyandry is when often the same woman or sometimes even several women will marry brothers together. And this allows for rather the land being divided divided into smaller chunks, it to be kept intact as a, um, a unit. So the reason why we care about these, and we'll talk about this in class on Wednesday, and what I really want to go over more rather than having you just listen to a video is work you through how we look at patterns of descent. Again, how do we transmit property and status um, through uh, family networks through kinship networks. And we're going to look at uh, primarily the various, uh, the two major forms of unilineal descent or matrilineages and patrilineages. So basically when you have transmission of wealth or resources, either through the maternal line or the mother's line or through the paternal line, the father's line. Um, bilateral descent, on the other hand, is when individuals can claim access to a broader network of kin, either through their mother or their father's side or both sides of the family or have a bit of a selective process.
Okay, so I'll go through these kinship diagrams in a little bit more length in our session on Wednesday. And we'll talk about, again, bilateral, patrilineal, matrilineal. Uh, I will also talk about, uh, go back into this, this is a naming convention. And also it's important because the, many societies have rules about which cousins you can and cannot marry. So for example, in some societies, marrying parallel cousins or again, cousins you're related to through a same sex parent um, is a taboo. But on the other hand, marrying through uh, opposite sex cousins is not. Hmm. Well, folks, I'm having some technological issues with recording, so we're just going to end the recording there. We'll have time to talk about the rest of the content. Uh, we'll work through the example that's listed on Wednesday, and then again, we'll talk about how families can be transformed in other ways outside of marriage um, this uh, in class on Wednesdays.